Welcome to the Writing Gym Podcast. We're here to pump up your writing. And now your host, Andy Brixey, personal trainer at the Writing Gym. Hey there, writers and news daters. In this episode, Annalisa and I have the opportunity to speak with Nashville-based editor and author Amy McConnell. The relationship between an editor and an author is so important. And for many debut authors, there are so many questions that need to be answered. Amy addresses how to find a quality editor and explains how that relationship is like a romantic one. You have to hear it. Get inside information from an expert editor that has worked at Howard Books at Simon & Schuster and is an acquiring editor for HarperCollins. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Amy McConnell is a Nashville-based writer and editor. She has served as both editor-in-chief and vice president of Howard Books at Simon & Schuster and is an acquiring editor for HarperCollins. She founded and directs WriterFest Nashville. She's also the co-author with Candace Cameron Burr of the USA Today bestseller, Kind is the New Classy. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And of course, we welcome back to the Writing Gym podcast, the lady who pumps your writing into publishing shape in the Writing Gym. Welcome back to the Writing Gym podcast, Annalisa. Thanks for having me, Andy. Of course. We're so excited to have both of you here. And I'm going to jump right in with a group question that we have gotten from so many different Writing Gym participants and so many of the um, people in our Write to Publish Facebook group. And that is for you, Amy. We have so many writers who have just completed a novel and they're curious about what exactly they should look for in a quality editor. Hmm. That's a great question. So (laughs) I've never looked for a quality editor myself. Um, I've I've always been the editor on the other side, but I have seen uh, relationships go poorly. And I think one of the first things that you want to look for is just chemistry. Right. Mm-hmm. So to see if you have the same sorts of um, tastes, perhaps, or this sort of similar interests, um, approach it like you would a friendship or a, a dating relationship. You know, just look and see if you have things that are in common so that you have common ground. What you do not want and what you want to avoid is a situation where you have a disparity of power. So, um, for instance, you don't want to have an editor who seems to have. Um, I was going to say delusions of grandeur, but ideas that they are perhaps more Ill- more elite than you, mm. or that they have higher taste than you. Um, that that sort of that is an, a false, I think, um, scenario for the relationship to begin because you really need to have the sense in which you're both um, you both have voice, you both have um, power, you both have. Um, you, you both bring something helpful to the table, um, but you do not want to be in a situation where one of you has an undue amount of power. It needs to, nece- it needs to of necessity, be a peer relationship. So there's mutual respect. That's a really good point, Amy, and I'm glad that you brought that up because it's it's a pitfall that I see a lot, not just in editor relationships, but also in agent relationships, oh, especially yes. for first-time authors who are just so excited that somebody said yes, and so they just kind of jump into it. And I love that you mm-hmm. compared that to a romantic relationship because probably at some point in our early lives, we all have some you know, uh, disaster crash story to tell Absolutely. about saying yes to the wrong person. Um, and, and it can be true for an agent and then you're in a legal binding relationship, you know, with an agent, with an editor where there isn't that simpatico and, and it can go sour, um, pretty quickly. Right. And I think when we're talking about when Andy mentioned, you know, with, with a, with a relationship with an editor, you want to feel, um, just as welcomed to accept counsel as you are to to reject it. I mean, there should not be any um, loss of faith when you do either of those things because it is always, first and foremost, your book and the editor should always respect that. And if for some reason you feel like you owe the editor or that the editor has something over you, then that's just you're starting off on the wrong foot. So yeah, so that's what I would look for is just sort of that balance of power and that feeling of chemistry between you that there is mutual respect. 
Wonderful. And can we just back it up? Because I bet there are a lot of listeners out there, you know, we just sort of throw these terms around and all this jargon. There are lots of different types of editors. You have experience as a publishing house editor. Tell us about about what that is. You worked at Simon & Schuster, uh, one of the big five. So tell us about what that looks like. What does an editor's job look like? What do they do every day? Right. I have to tell you just like one of the fun things is, um, you know, I, I spend my days mostly with people who in some form or fashion know this business. So, um, but every once in a while I meet somebody who completely doesn't understand it. And I, uh, I was running it. I ran into a relative once, um, at a dinner party and he said, Oh, so I hear you're like an editor. And I said, and I said, yeah. And he said, but at this point, aren't there computer programs that do that? And I just, I just did a spit take like, <laughs> that's not what I do at all. Um, cause his assumption was that I actually, um, proofread perhaps, but the, the point is when you're an in-house editor, you are the champion of a book. So you are the person who advocates to the publishing house for the book and for the publishing house to the author. Um, so you're that person who is ultimately their champion. You should also bring to bear your own chops, your own ability to sort of critique and help them hone their book to make it more marketable mm-hmm. um, or more commercially um, saleable. Uh, so that would that was my job. So for about um, 25 years, I was an in-house editor. So first as a managing editor, and then ultimately as a an editor in chief. So I oversaw the whole list. But um, but I always had authors I was championing in-house. So you a, a given editor will have about. 10 to 20 authors that she represents in-house typically. Um, And uh, so in a given year, perhaps 12 or 15 books a year that she actively champions in-house. So what I would do is I would work with agents to acquire the rights to publish a book. And then I would work hand in hand with the author to make that book the best it could be before we bring it to market. I would work, of course, in-house with the people in-house to make that happen as well. So that would include um, salespeople, first and foremost, because those are the people that are pounding on, pounding the pavement and pounding on doors to make sure that book gets in the right places. And then I would also work with the in-house staff to make sure it was designed beautifully, packaged beautifully, um, that the, our, all of our channels had the appropriate information about the book, sales copy, search engine optimized, marketing copy, um, and the like. And then also I would work with sub like the, the other editors who might be involved. So for instance, um, copy editors, or proofreaders, um, design editors, those kinds of things. So that was my role. As an yeah, in-house. so it's it's a it's a really big job, and it encompasses a lot of project management in some ways, um, and mm-hmm. really having a finger in all of the pots of the whole process of creating a book. Um, so one of the conversations that Andy and I mitigate a whole lot and educate about a whole lot, especially in our Facebook group, Right to Publish, is you know people that say, oh, it's so hard to publish. Why is it so hard to publish? Editors are such snobs. Agents are such snobs, you know, that kind of thing. And then on the other side, you know, I have relationships with a lot of editors and agents and sort of people behind the scenes. So tell us, let's just like open up that door, slide back the curtain, um, and and hear your perspective on what you see, right? Because people, you know, even though we're supposed to get an agent, people send all kinds of things to editors and flowers and chocolates and things that try to get them in the door. Um, so tell us what that looks like from your perspective. Well, I'm in an in, in interesting place at the moment because I have my own business now. So mm-hmm. I, as you mentioned, I've written my own, I've written on my own. I do some ghostwriting and I also have a book. I just got a book deal this week for a smaller book that I'm doing. Um, just a book of essays I'm really excited about. So that'll be fun. But um, I would just say that I'm in a, an interesting place because I definitely do know what it's like to be in-house, but I also know what it's like to be on this side of the desk where I have an editor who tells me what to do now. Um, But what I will say first and foremost is that the people who are in the editorial desks in-house, so at the big publishing houses or even the smaller publishing houses um, or or the agents, they're all just like you and me. They all love the work. They are in it because they're passionate about it. They are not in it for the money. I always like to tell people that because there is not a ton of money in publishing. There never will be a ton of money in publishing. Oh, unless you're JK Rowling or, you know, what, if you're making a ton of money, then 
that's a different deal. But day to day in New York, the people that I worked with in their and their offices um, were not in it because they were making a ton of money. They were in it because they love the work. They're passionate about literacy. They're passionate about books that change culture. They're passionate about reading on the train. So, um, so I would just first and foremost say that these people are in it because they're just like you and me. They love it. Um, so um, it's. I rarely have met someone who is an editor who is a snob. Mostly they just have their lane that they love to be in. Um, I have one particular editor friend who is a fantastic sci-fi guy. And he really is kind of like, I would almost say he's a snob about sci-fi because he reads so deeply about it. But is he a snob really? No, he's just so in his own lane right. that that is all he can see. So um, each of us, I think, has our own... Um, 12 things that we are passionate about, we really love. And it's really about just making sure you find the person who has a shared passion and that can make their uh, life goal for today to be an advocate for you in their house. Mm. That is a really important distinction. Thank you so much for sharing that with us um, and for really validating the kinds of things that we say. You know, um, ultimately, these are people and they're people who love words and books and stories uh, just like we do. And, and I think approaching it, you know, you, you spoke earlier about the way that an editor might ask and or, or act, sorry, and and come across with this persona of I know everything. And I would say that the other end of the spectrum on the author's side, um, you know, there's a lot of fronting that happens there too around, you know, I know what's best for my book and this is my book. And um, at the end of the day, if we can just sit down together and enjoy a meal together and talk like humans, then beautiful things can happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think usually the fronting happens when there's fear, mm -hmm. right? So when we, when we feel like we're in some way threatened, then we often go up, right? And so I think often just to kind of say, we're both invested in this. We both have skin in this or all three of us have skin. In the case of an agent, editor, author relationship, we all have skin in this game. Um, and let's just en enjoy it because gosh, it is such a joy when we get to do it. Um, I have this one author friend who often will say, I, I don't really love the writing, but I love having written. And I always just say, you know, like, let's just really try to enjoy every stage of it because what a gift it is to be able to do this thing, right? It's such a crazy good job, even though it is very difficult often. Yeah. And, you know, um, one of our writing gym members, uh, she's in the VIP right now, so she's finishing her novel. Um, awesome. Maya. That. Isn't that great? Um, and so she's wondering about the agent relationship. And I would like to hear from your perspective. I and mean, we sort of see the front end where it's writer to agent. Tell us about the back end, you know, from the editor's perspective agent to editor, what kind of attributes do you look for as an editor to say, yes, you know, this agent is reputable or, um, you know, somebody that I want to work with? Wow. That's a really interesting question. So, so we're talking about attributes in an agent that an editor prefers. Am yeah. I like summing that up? Yeah. You know, what? there's a side note, clear and concise. That's the editor's job. So I'm boiling it way down right, <laughs> to a thick, thick consistency there. So attributes of an agent I enjoy. So um, I definitely lean toward agents who are pleasant to work with, who do not throw their weight around, right? So mm -hmm. that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier where I was talking about I avoid the disparity of power between the agent and editor or editor and client. Um, so yeah, I look for agents who love the work. So I'm, a, I'm definitely attracted to people who love being in this space, who um, look forward to being with me so that we can talk about the work, right? So um, that don't just call when there's bad news or when they have hard stuff to deliver. Um, I can think of a handful of agents. I know their taste. Who, um, I'm thinking of a handful of agents that I know their taste um, really well, you know, so that when they call, I know pretty much when they call what they're bringing me is going to be of, um, of interest to me because I like their taste. 
Um, as when I am thinking about an agent that I want to work with as a writer, which is what I do now for the most mm -hmm. part, or um, a lot of times I do ghost writing and co-writing. So when an agent, um, when I'm working with an agent, I look for people who have a good reputation in the industry um, who've worked with, I like the agents who've worked with people I already know. There's really no, no draw to going back in house at this point. Right. Wonderful. So as seeing this through the lens of both an editor and a writer, these, these mm -hmm. industry changes that are, that have been happening over the past few years, do you have some tips for people who are first time authors or people who are just coming into the industry now as to how to, uh, how to approach it? Or is that, is the way you approach it different than you would have, you know, say 20 years ago? Well, I would say one thing that I love about being alive in this time is that you as a writer are the CEO of your own career. I think in the past, I just watched, who's, who's watched um, Genius, right? So Genius about, um, you know, the, um, <laughs> what, tell me what's the name of the author, the, the editor who edited Faulkner and Thomas Wolfe, and um, you guys have seen it probably already. But anyway, the point is, back in the day, you needed an editor in-house, um, in a, in a publishing house if you wanted your book to be published. That is no longer the case. Some of my favorite authors are taking the reins of their career and just saying, to heck with that. Like, I'm going to just create the book that I want mm -hmm. rather than have to go through all the different hoops to get it made. And um, some of the people who already have a, a book deal in-house are hybrid publishing, right? Um, they have, they, they publish their own stuff and they go through a traditional publisher or people who are self-publishing are getting picked up by the big publishers, right? Mm -hmm. th that happens so many times. So often I myself picked up at least five books that had been self-published when I was acquiring. So there are different way, different models of publishing now. And, and every one of those models, the writer is the CEO of her own career. And I love that about this current marketplace. In the past, that was not always the case. It was very dependent. There was a dependent relationship between the author and the, the editor or the publishing house, if you will, mm -hmm. um, where it was, uh, where if they don't like me anymore, then my career is over, um, which, is, which is not okay with me, honestly. And I'm glad that time is over. Um, so I think that's an, an interesting shift in our current marketplace. And I love it. I am, I encourage any author or writer that I work with to embrace that and to see it as, um, as an invigorating challenge. Mm -hmm. That said, you really can't go into it. The, the inverse of that, the responsibility is really there. It's on you to be curious and always ask questions. Nothing is, um, is beneath you in the sense of like, I don't need to think about that. Um, so many times I'll hear authors go, well, you know, I'll let the publisher take care of that someday, which is to a degree, um, it's, it is a, it's an idealistic way of thinking. And I think that's very nice, but it's actually not very pragmatic. You really have to take ownership of all aspects of your career, including your public publishing, um, marketing, your publicity, all those pieces ultimately reside with you. So, um, so yeah, that's something that I always like to to make sure we have full disclosure on when I'm working with writers. Absolutely. Excellent points. That was a mouthful. I'm sorry. No, I have quite that, a lot to say about that. That was a real, that <laughs> no. was really good. And, um, so Amy, I, I met you in Tennessee. We had a great time together and we chatted and hung out a little bit and, uh, you've got a, a really interesting event. I won't spill the beans. I will let you spill the beans. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. I think when, what you're talking about is we met at Digital Book World last year, and I was so excited because at Digital Book World, we were just weeks away from the launch of the first ever Writer Fest here in Nashville, Tennessee, and it went so well. We had the time of our lives. So Writer Fest is a dream come true for me. Um, I have, as you can imagine, I've been to dozens if not hundreds of book festivals and conferences and fairs and things of that nature. And I love them as an extrovert, which is so weird for an editor, but as an extrovert, I love to get together with people who are of like mind writers in particular. 
And I had this dream we bring together writers of book, song, film, blog, what have you, and that we would be in a collaborative space uh, where we could just celebrate the written word and learn from each other. So that's what we did in, in November of uh, last year. We did our first conference ever, and we had um, keynotes from Leanne Moriarty, who is the um, international best-selling author of Big Little Lies, which, as you know, was turned into a movie. Mm -hmm. And so she was there talking about both of those things, about screenwriting, about no being a novelist. And then for our second keynote speaker, we had Tom Douglas, who is the um, number one hit songwriting uh, writer for uh, I think there were 10 country hits that he's written so he was there and he brought along Chris Stefano, who also has written I don't know how many number one hit country hits he writes mostly for Carrie Underwood but also for a number of others and so he came songwriter and then um, for our third keynote we had um, Liz Kukowski who writes for Amy, Amy Poehler and Tina Fey and Saturday Night Live and Community and other comedic screenplays so Screenwriting, songwriting, book writing, film writing. So all these writers came together. We had, I think, ultimately we had something like 60 people and, um, who spoke about writing, the business of writing, the creative process and all those good things. So this year we're doing it again. It's going to be even amped up from there, which I can't even imagine what that's going to look like. It sounds like, you know, last year was for me, it was heaven and, and, and we got a lot of great feedback about it. And this year is going to be even better than last year. So we're looking forward to that. It's going to be November 6th, 7th and 8th of this year in Nashville, Tennessee. So please check us out. Uh, Writer <laughs> Fest, Nashville. That's amazing. Um, and I will make sure for our listeners to put links in the show notes to that. Um, Thank you. So Amy, the, the big final question that we ask every guest who comes on the Writing Gym podcast, if you could give one piece of advice to aspiring writers, what would it be? Leave nothing off the page. Bring it all to the page. Um, I think a lot of times authors think I'm gearing up to that big scene. I'm gearing up to um, to revealing something. Um, I'll I'll get to that uh, after chapter two. And I just say, just bring your best stuff to the page every day. Leave nothing behind because there's gonna if you bring it, the well will just keep bringing up um, good stuff, right? So um, just bring it all. Bring your best stuff to the page. I love that. We've, we've never gotten that piece of advice before. So that, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. If you like what you've heard and are interested to see if you're the right fit for the writing gym, here's what to do next. Head to www.datewiththemuse.com slash publish now and book an appointment to speak with our team. Here's how it works. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes and we'll get crystal clear on three things the best way for you to publish, the best way to achieve your publishing dream, and the exact strategy you should be using to reach your publishing goals. Remember, publishing a book well doesn't happen on its own. You need expert guidance to make it happen. We've helped writers all over the world to finish, publish, and sell their novels well, all while sharing their unique story and making the world a better place along the way. To see if we can help you to do the same, head to www.datewiththemuse.com slash publish now. I'm Andy, personal trainer over in the writing gym, and we'll talk soon. Happy writing. And hey, since you listened all the way to the end of this special episode, here's this week's little quirk of the week. Kind of like a blooper reel, but not. I don't want to be a rat, but Annalisa loves the 1920s and is especially in love with any kind of art deco. Thank you so much for listening and happy writing.